Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. Are we live, Mahesh? Okay. And how do I see if there are any people online? Okay, I guess on, on YouTube window I can see if people are. Are we live, Mahesh? Hi Ashish, can you hear me well? Can you see a blank slide which I will start writing on very soon? Great, I guess there is a bit of lag. I'll see the question, I'll read the question and uh, you know, after a few minutes, I should be answering your question. So, hold on tight till then. There is a little bit of lag between uh, the question asked and when I see your question. Okay, we have the first question from Umang says, what is the difference between authorized capital and issued uh, capital? I'll take a moment to explain that. Let's get started with the first question. Yes, it works. All right. So there are what? Three, four, five, five different types of capitals. So authorized capital is the first type of capital. Now, essentially, it's, it's not that there are different types of capital. It's like a Venn diagram, if you will. So, oh, pardon my drawing. This is authorized capital and then there is uh, issued capital that is within this, all right. So this is issued capital and then there can be subscribed capital, subscribed capital and then there can be called up and paid up capital, called up capital and a further when can be a paid up capital paid up capital so essentially what we are saying is the company has the authority to raise let's say 100 rupees this is 100 crores let's say 100 crores this is authorized why do they call it authorized they call it authorized because this is something which the company is authorized to do 
who authorizes it there is you know ministry of corporate affairs so mca there is registrar of companies so there is whole regulatory machinery which <clears throat> to which the company reports saying this is the uh, amount of uh, this is the amount of total capital that we need and you know out of 100 you may not need all 100 crores in the very first year first few months so you say i'm going to go step by step and in the in the first year let's say first year i'm only only going to need 40 crores so this is what i need in the first year so accordingly this is what uh, am i going to issue so i am going to issue less than the authorized capital and then gradually i can issue more maybe in the second year maybe in the second year i will need say 40 more and i'll issue more and therefore the issued capital the issued capital is going to be uh, you know between uh, you know below the authorized capital or a subset of authorized capital as we better understand it and then out of the issued then uh you offer to public to subscribe to the capital buy your shares it is possible that only 30 crores worth of applications are received that's also possible and then you start calling that subscribed capital uh and then you know further on but the question was only on difference between authorized and issued so i hope i have answered uh the question let me see if i have answered the question yeah i think that was the first question i've done that waiting for next question or maybe in the meanwhile i'll explain the further uh, capital types as well so this is issued capital and then out of the 40 i said this 30 uh, can be the subscribed for capital subscribed capital and uh, what happens is when you apply for shares the company does not uh, ask you to pay all the money at a go although that happens now uh, in most cases they ask you to pay whole money uh, up front but mostly you would see that um, application money is say 50% 20% uh, of the total share value so they are going to call up only let's say 20 crore so this is called called up capital the company has called the shareholder to pay you know a certain percentage of the share book value and then there is paid up capital it is possible that some people pay that you know share value to subscribe to the share other people change their mind they don't pay or they don't have the money they don't pay they default they forget about it for various uh, different reasons and then you can say you know 19 crore is going to be paid up capital in most cases you have issued subscribed called up paid up all these numbers are same because whatever company issues is uh, applied for by the public uh, the company calls for all the money and everybody pays up the money but there are some cases where people don't pay and there can be calls in arrears amount to be recovered i hope i have answered the question Umang has a follow up question says it means authorized capital is a guesswork which a company makes before registering or is there some calculation being made all right so uh, it's not really a guesswork uh, so <laughs> so let me say this is not this is not a guesswork in accounting in finance we call it with a more respectable term we call it estimation all right so the authorized capital is an estimation see before any business is started a lot of projections are made all right so business projections can be you know uh, in year year 1 to to let's say year 10 what do we expect how 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 much revenue do you think you're going to make in each year and in order to come up with revenue you know that revenue is price times quantity how many quantity are you going to be able to sell and how at what price per unit and hence you'll have numbers on you know for each of the years the revenue and similarly you will have 
you know expenses and you will have profit etc in order to generate all of these revenues you will need to purchase some assets right for any any business to start you will have to set up let's say a traditional manufacturing business you set up plant machinery uh, buy land so you've estimated how much money you need and also a lot of estimation goes into let's say if this is the uh, life cycle of the business let's say this is year 1 this is year 5 year 10 and year 15 we expect that in the first 5 years we are going to need uh, let's say on on y axis you have the level of investment and this also represents in some ways the capacity production capacity that you want to have so in the first 5 years we are good to go with let's say 100 unit production level and at the end of fifth year we expect to expand and then 100 units is not going to do anything for us we are going to go to 200 units and so on right so all of these projections require a lot of business planning market research a uh, competitor analysis and then the numbers are reached at arrived at and then if you need to build this capacity how much amount needs to be spent on xyz items that's done and then you say okay what is the money that i need and accordingly you decide what is my authorized capital the one clear driver of authorized capital uh, sanction in the beginning the company takes sanction saying 100 crore uh the one driver is uh, the fee that you have to pay so there are some slabs uh if you i'm just taking an example let's say you register with 10 crore as the authorized capital you will have to pay certain amount of fee some you know let's say 10000 or it may be a percentage number i don't remember exactly what is the current structure but it can be a percentage uh, as well uh so if if you want authorized capital of 10 crore you pay 10000 if you want you know 20 crore then this doubles to 20000 so why do you want to spend 20000 right now you will need uh, 20 crores after let's say first 5 years uh, of operations so you don't want to have a lot of authorized capital right now so you know it's a mix of all those factors Okay I hope I've answered your question Umang I will jump on to the next question which is from Raghu says cash received and discount given what is the explanation of debit and credit rule okay let me let me get a new slide all right so so the question is cash received and discount given so when you receive cash what is the general entry so cash received cash account debit uh, and you're going to receive cash either uh, for uh, let's say sales sales account that's a typical entry and what is happening is you you are allowing discount cash received and discount given so cash has been received you sold goods worth 100 the cash received is 90 uh so about this okay there's some problem just hold on Okay, let's resume. So, uh, ignore this drawing that I've done here. So, there is a ten rupees worth of discount that has been given. Discount account debit. Now, who was the question from? The question was from Raghu, and he wants to know the explanation. So, the explanation is that sale is a uh, is revenue. It's an income. all incomes are uh, nominal account nominal account and the rule of nominal account is uh, credit all incomes and gains debit all expenses and credit all incomes hence sale has been credited on the other hand you have cash cash is an asset assets are real account 
and the rule for real account is debit what comes in. I'm writing in shorthand. So debit what comes in and cash account is debit. Discount on the other hand is, is a loss, is an expense. This is discount allowed when you uh, when you want to promote the cash payment. You, you tell your customers that if you pay me early, uh, if you pay me right now, I'll give you 10% discount and the customer did that. So this is kind of an expense slash loss. I would call it you know more an expense rather than loss because uh, you're promoting uh, the business that way. You are trying to get more and more revenue. So it's an expense. Expenses are nominal account and you debit all expenses. That's the explanation. Even if it is uh, considered a loss, you debit all losses as well. I hope this has answered the question and sorry for this hard work. Sovik says, uh, difference between trade discount and cash discount. I'll do that uh, in the same slide. Let me write here. So cash discount and trade discount. So the difference between cash discount and trade discount is as follows. You must have gone to some melas, right? Some festival. Uh, Diwali is coming up. So you will see uh, flat 15% off. 15 is actually under state fund. Let's say 50% off on what? Woodland. And you want to buy shoes. You go there or I go there. Both of us, any of us, anybody goes there, they, they are going to get 50% flat off. This is called trade discount. Uh, the example uh, is festival discounts festival discounts okay the feature is key feature is that this is applicable for all so applicable for all anybody who goes there they get there's no uh, you know differentiation there is no distinction between the customers on the other hand the cash discount is uh, you know an exceptional discount an exceptional discount which you give particularly to promote uh, cash collection to promote collection from the debtors uh, therefore you do not give cash discount to everybody you you know you know in the malls and all you just go there and there are discounts fixed prices but you know not that scenario go to a shopkeeper go to a let's say wholesale market or any other retail store uh, wherever you have some items which do not have an MRP on it or places where you can negotiate. And that's where cash discount comes in. Uh, even though, you know, it's not necessarily encouraging debtors to pay cash, which is the case which we earlier discussed. But uh, in order to just make a sale, uh, you quote a thousand rupees, uh, typically in the mailers, right? <laughs> a lot of haggling goes on. Uh, the seller quotes a price 100 rupees, you say no, no, 60, and the deal gets done on 80. Uh, 20 rupees is cash discount that the seller has given to you. Now, the, the accounting treatment for both is different. In accounting treatment, trade discount is not recorded. Not recorded, meaning if an item was for 100 rupees and now you, have, you are giving 50% off, the cost of this item is going to be considered as 50. While calculating the profit, you cannot say that you have a loss of 50. You can't count that. You will directly go to uh, uh, 50 and then, come, sorry, this is not the cost. We should say price. This is price. You are going to compare it to the cost. The cost is, let's say, 40 rupees and hence you will show a profit of 10 rupees. Originally, you, you showed a price of 100, the cost was still 40 and you were making a profit of 60, all right? So this was the original proposition. However, during festival seasons, you have decided that you are going to give discount to everyone and you are happy making only 10 rupee profit uh, off season sale or what is it called? Uh, finishing stock clearance sales, for example. Now they're happy making only uh, 10 rupee a piece. Earlier, they've made enough of 60 rupee a piece, all right? 
So in the books of accounts, this is the uh, treatment. However, in this case, during the regular, uh, you know, uh, selling hours or selling days, selling months, uh, you are going to show 100 rupees as the uh, uh, selling price and uh, the cost is going to be uh, 40. Same cost is going to be same. And now you sell to somebody for 90 rupees to some somebody else at 80 rupees and the cost is going to be same and the, the net profit which you're going to make are going to be you know, different numbers in these cases. So here we show it as uh, an expense. Here we do not show show it at all, not recorded. All right, I hope that clarifies. Next is what is the concept of insolvency? Okay, insolvency, basically you, uh, it's, it's not necessarily an accounting concept. It is in a way, uh, in many ways actually, yeah. So insolvency, insolvency is when you own less than you, what you owe. In case of businesses, the value of assets can, you know, what you own are the assets and what you owe are the liabilities. All right. Now, what is when when does the insolvency take place? We we know that assets are always equal to liabilities, and whenever this uh, equal to sign gets converted into this for various reasons, uh, you say that you know you are towards insolvency. How is this going to happen? There are different different reasons for this. One of the reasons which I'm going to explain is going to be through income and expenses. So you have incomes and you have expenses and it is going to result in a loss or a profit. The net result of expenses and incomes. Hopefully, if you have you know more incomes, you're going to have profit. And if you have less incomes, you will have a loss. <clears throat> when a business continues to make loss, when a business continues to make loss, what happens? Well, let's let's uh, examine the opposite first. If you make profit, we've seen in the uh, accounting equation that under the capital, you are going to add the profit. The profit is going to increase the capital. <coughs> And if it is a loss, you are going to reduce it from the capital. Now, imagine if you continue to have losses, your capital is going to come down drastically, right? This results in, uh, you know, whenever this happens, uh, not only you make, uh, you know, uh, losses, meaning that you have to spend more. The problem is, where do you get the money to spend? Because incomes are 100, expenses are 110. Now, where are you going to get the additional 10 from? This is when you uh, start accessing uh, the you know, funds which were supposed to be uh, for assets or start selling off assets and so on. Uh, and in that, in that process, the value of assets goes down uh, and it reduces, uh, you know, uh, the assets and liabilities are not equal. If you were to sell off the assets uh, and try to pay the liabilities, it's not going to work out. And there are other many other reasons as well for that because uh, when you go out to do a fire sale of assets, which means that immediately you have to sell, you don't fetch the right price, you fetch lower prices uh, as well. So, you know, in short, when you owe more than what you own, you, you call it insolvency. But, you know, it's much deeper concept and needs more discussion and may not be right now, uh, you know, uh, it may not be a good idea to get into the details of how insolvency works. But I, I think I scratched the surface. <clears throat> I may have confused you more <laughs> if, if not helped. Okay. Raghu says, uh, analyzing general entries on the basis of claims is generally accepted practice. <clears throat> so... Uh, this, uh, you know, thing of claims, the the idea of using, you know, this approach of understanding uh, the, the transactions through the claims 
This is something that I I've not read anywhere, but I just thought of it. I don't know. It's been so long that I've been teaching this course that I don't remember whether whether I read it somewhere. But I think some day I was sitting, I was writing about how do we explain this better, and I wrote it. But I don't want to claim the credit for it at this point in time since I'm not sure. But it's not a generally accepted practice. Uh, people don't talk in this language. That is something you know uh, uh, that I tried to make it easier for people to understand, and it works in some cases. In some cases, it does not work. For example, if there is a loss by a fire, uh, you know, let me explain that. In some cases, it it backfires. <laughs> so when you have loss by fire, what is the general entry? The general entry is loss by fire debit to purchase account. Now, in this case, this is a loss. You know, claim is actually going down. Why do you debit it? Because you know, you said debit uh, means increase in the claims. In some places, not going to work, and then we resort to more uh, you know logical explanation, which is that uh, your your claim is going down on the stock, which is being shown here. And and typically, when you give up your claim on the stock, you'll get cash against it, and you'll debit that. But this is a loss. Uh, and hence, you have to write loss, and you debit all expenses and losses according to nominal account. Hence, the scientific explanation also works out well. But you will not read about the claims approach in the textbooks. I doubt that. Uh, Raghu says, uh, when closing stock is valued at market price, then what is the logic behind crediting closing stock in trading account? Okay, so uh, I'll, these are two questions. The first question is: Is stock valued on market price? Number one. Second, uh, why do you credit closing stock in the trading account? I'll answer these two questions uh, separately. So here I go. So the first question was: Closing stock. The stock is valued on market price. Accounting is done on cost value. All the assets are recorded at the cost price and then depreciated. But that is true for fixed assets. Out of the current assets and only for stock, there is a process of revaluation of stock. Again, I have not discussed this in the course. This is not in the course purview. This is a much more advanced topic. Uh, maybe I mentioned. Mahesh, am I audible? I think I got disconnected for a bit. I don't know how long it was. Okay, I'm going to uh, restart from here. So the closing stock. Well, the question was the closing stock is valued at market price. So I said, uh, let's answer this question separately. And I said, uh, typically you value all assets on cost price and then you depreciate it. But uh, that's for fixed asset. Only in case of stock, there is uh, uh, revaluation which is done. Uh, and I said this is a topic of advanced discussion, not covered in the basic course. Uh, but I'll just scratch the surface. So revaluation is done of the stock. It can result in either loss or a profit, and accordingly, tax uh, payment is calculated. All right, that's one part of the question. The second is uh, why is why is uh, closing stock credited in the trading account? Uh, I don't think that everybody has gone to the trading account till now, but I'll just explain it for your benefit. Oh, sorry, this is a trading account. In the trading account, it's not about what are you debiting or crediting. 
uh, it's more about uh, you know showing incomes and expenses on uh, you know two different sides so debit side and credit side and you're showing all income and expenses the reason for showing closing stock here is only to take it out of to calculate the cost of goods sold right so you show opening stock here and you show purchases here all right and you have direct expenses i'm going shorthand again so this is the total cost cost of goods available to be sold all right so so let us say this is these are 100 units the actual sales uh, during the year is for only let's say 90 units okay now the purpose of trading account is to figure out the gross profit and people who have not gone to the final account uh, do not worry about uh, you know this discussion here uh, because you will understand it later so 100 units of uh, goods were available 90 units were sold remaining 10 units are being shown here why so 100 units here on this side and by showing 10 units here we are essentially reducing reducing these 10 units from these 100 so that cost cost of only 90 units is shown here in order to calculate the gross profit we have sale of sale price of 90 units we should have cost of goods sold which is 90 units that should be compared to the gross profit so uh, we don't necessarily credit the closing stock here it's you know logic is a bit different and of course when you when you have purchase account you do uh, you know do a closing entry all of that is fine but intuitively understand the reason behind this uh, so it's it's it has more to do with uh, the number that needs to be calculated which is gross profit okay next question hi ravi good evening difference between discount received and discount allowed okay that's easy discount received and discount allowed so two situations this is discount received and second is discount allowed so uh, the the clarity will come if you decide who who you are in this you know case so you are let's say this is your company and this is your supplier a big manufacturer all right you are a retailer this is you or this is your business and this is the whole seller whole seller this is your supplier okay what is you know what is the flow of goods and cash how does it look like so what happens is the goods go here from uh, the supplier to the business to the retailer and the money is going to go to the whole seller all right so if this is you this is your business your business is a receiver receiver of goods and uh, what do you call it? Pay. Pay for the goods received. Right? Pay means you have to pay. So if you have to pay to the wholesaler, let's say uh, goods worth 1000 were supplied to you and now you're going to pay to the wholesaler and you settle the deal in 900. All right. So when you pay to the uh, supplier for the goods received, the supplier can give you some discount and you are going to receive that discount. So uh, the hundred, uh, sorry, thousand rupees of goods against this, you only have to pay 900, all right? Did you gain or did you lose? You gained, right? You gained, in other words, you received you received or you saved right so this whole thing is named as discount received so when you make a payment you receive a discount okay this is the discount received 
and the opposite is true for discount allowed now imagine you are the wholesaler you're not the retailer so if you are the wholesaler and you are going to sell 100 uh, rupees 100 rupees worth of goods to the retailer and retailer pays you so these are goods and retailer has given you cash worth 900 now you were supposed to receive 1000 right and you have received only 900 the re uh, remaining 100 is a loss to you you this is something that you have given up all right or this is something that you have allowed to happen <laughs> so therefore this is a discount discount that you or the business allows to the customer you have accepted it you have said okay i need to give up 100 rupees in order for me to sell this uh, you know these many goods uh, if i don't give discount i i'm not going to uh, be able to sell this so uh, allowing discount a uh, discount is same as giving discount to someone else okay what is the difference between us gap and indian gap all right so this is too big a question <laughs> and honestly i i may not be the best person to answer this either i have not read us gaps uh, but i'll just give you some idea uh, that i can so there is something called what do you call it international financial reporting standard international financial reporting standard ifrs which aims at uh converging or you know um, uh there is a there is an international movement towards ensuring that financial disclosures are shown in similar ways across all countries so that you pick up a country uh, you pick up a financial report financial statement of a company in india and you pick up a, a report of company in us you should be able to compare these uh imagine if i give you you know uh, right now you you've seen the financial statement of reliance and you know you know the flow non current assets and current assets not uh, uh, equity capital non current uh, liabilities and current liabilities if i give you another statement which is presented differently suddenly you'll be you know uh, shocked and you'll say okay where do i find this so there is an international movement which is happening and india is also moving towards this there were different phases in which we were moving towards following uh, the uh, standards which are internationally accepted and also it's not only uh, it, it doesn't only deal with the disclosure how do you disclose it but also treatment of items anyways the the basic point is that uh, the difference there may be a lot of you know many differences i don't want to get uh, get into that uh, right now and also for lack of my for my ignorance <laughs> essentially Uh, but i'm saying uh, internationally we are moving converging towards uh, standardized statements okay aditya says good morning very well whenever it is morning good morning umang says the principles of conservatism accrual and matching seem similar and overlapping can you please establish clear cut distinction between these three it's good that they are overlapping and uh, i would say they are interconnected <laughs> uh, and each each three i think serves a different purpose but let me um, try to uh, elaborate on each of those and see if i can create a distinction so conservatism let me write conservatism then you have accrual accrual and the third one is matching that's right actually you know when i think about it they are not overlapping at all <laughs> conservatism says conservatism says be ready be ready for the rainy day that's what principle of conservatism says what does it mean it means that we should anticipate we should anticipate losses or expenses and accordingly prepare for that how do we do that for example we create reserves 
we create provisions right this is called uh, you know anticipating that now provisions can be created for different purposes uh, provision for tax is one simple uh, this thing and provision for dividend is another one then there can be provision for bad debts debts can go bad likewise reserves can be general in nature meaning any losses which which uh, sort of come up we can make good of those from here uh, and there can be specific uh, it's called capital reserves but i'm going to write specific reserves which means a loan has to be paid in 10 years let's start saving every year that's what we do in the household finance as well so this is what is you know conservatism being ready for the rainy day anticipating the losses recording the losses uh, or creating a provision for those losses as as soon as we know that there is a credible threat or an estimated uh, event that could happen then uh, the accrual principle the accrual principle is different accrual principle says no uh, accrual principle means no cash not on cash basis okay you have money in your pocket and when you do your money accounting you say i have 100 rupees in my pocket today i spent 20 uh, but uh, you know i have 80 in my pocket uh, i bought some more things but i have not paid additional 20 that i needed to i still have you know 80 in my pocket that is cash accounting money accounting whatever you have in your pocket the accounting is not done on on you know cash basis there is a cash flow statement although which is you know which tells you uh, which gives you a cash basis view of the uh, finances of a business but the accounting is done on accrual basis which means uh, when when did you deliver the goods delivery of goods or services okay so when did you do this delivery of goods and services and this means uh, financial financial year 2019 20 or financial year 2020 21 all right there are two years in question let's say now goods were delivered here and the cash was received here all right now in which year are you going to show the income this year or this year right that's the question so income is going to be recorded in this year because the goods were delivered and you have completed your side of transaction you you you've completed your responsibility uh, by delivering the goods and now it is up to the customer Uh, to pay you for that, and if the customer doesn't pay, you can sue him and follow whatever legal recourse is available. Uh, but having delivered the uh, goods, having completed your side of transaction, income should be recorded in this year. This means that the income income has accrued. Accrued means earned. Income has been earned. All right. in this year this is accrual principle likewise in case of expenses if so let me just draw like here if uh, services have been received for example uh, you know salary salary for march 2020 all right this comes within this financial year March 2020, the employee has worked for this year. the The employee has already worked. You have not paid the salary, but it will still be shown as an expense here. You may pay cash to the employee in the next year in April, but it is still the salary for March for the previous year. This is called accrual principle, which means due basis. whenever it becomes due when does it become due whether income or expense when does it become due whenever the goods or services uh, have been delivered to whichever party it is all right this is accrual principle now matching principle is different matching principle says in order for us in order for us to figure out the result 
right? The financial result, the financial outcome, which typically is the profit, you will match the incomes of the financial year to the expenses of the financial year. Now, these two are connected in a way, accrual and matching. However, accrual guides you during the year when you are writing the uh, transactions, uh, you know, when you have to recognize that this is a revenue for this year. Matching, on the other hand, comes into picture at the end of the year when you have to figure out the result for the given financial year. You match the incomes of the current year to the expenses of the current year to figure out the taxable profit for the current year. All right. This is what matching does. And within matching, of course, you uh, tie accrual principle uh, in order to decide which expenses belong to current year and which ones belong to the next year or previous year. All right. So here is uh, a contrast between these three. Conservative, conservatism uh, principle is certainly very different. Uh, accrual and matching are related. Uh, matching principle makes use of, builds up on the accrual principle. All right, I think I have caught up with all the questions. Are there more? Yeah. Manjula says, uh, good evening. Hi. Due to a personal loss, oh, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry to hear about that. Um, is there an option to attend it again? I I am afraid not. I think uh, the NPTEL team handles all these issues. And I am at least not aware of uh, any such recourse. All right. But you could uh, certainly send an email to the NPTEL team to figure out if there is an option of you know, this nature. Sorry to hear about the loss in the family. Okay. More questions? I think there were some questions which were sent to me uh, were asked on the BTL office. We heard chitter chatter from the office. Okay, I'm opening the Excel sheet. All right, there are some questions here. Let me see if I can answer some. What is the meaning of fixed asset? Okay, I think that's something that has been answered. Can there be a case where expenses and incomes are equal? No profit, no loss. Of course, there is. And when we go to the break-even point analysis later in the course, uh, at that point in time, you know, you'll see more more about it. And then Asad Khan asks, "How was you?" I think that's a that's not an expected question. Suresh has written a question. Personal accounts are related to. Uh, okay, in assignment two, question 12, fine. The accepted option is outstanding expenses, but even prepaid expenses, accrued income, and also income received in advance are representative of personal account. So typically, uh, uh, Suresh, uh, the other things are assets. So outstanding expenses are personal account because they are liability, but prepaid expenses and accrued income they are uh, uh, assets. So as in assets, we don't have a category of representative uh, personal uh, assets or anything of that sort. Okay. 
Okay, let me look at further questions. Samir says, okay, he likes my teaching style. Nice, thank you. Uh, he is looking for some practical understanding the practical aspects. Question one is how finance and accounting is different from management accounting, managerial accounting. Second question is please suggest any good book to refer and you have already informed us introductory video. All right, I'll just bring these questions to the slides because I don't think other people can see it. All right, these are the questions that have been asked on the form. Okay. How finance and accounting is different from managerial accounting? I think I, I talk about this in the beginning. So financial accounting versus management accounting. Financial accounting is more, uh, you know, like a data collection. This is database creation. This is the backend, right? And managerial accounting is more kind of analytics. This is analysis. And we will do some part of it in this course. I think towards the end, we will do break-even analysis. We will do inventory uh, management, inventory management techniques. Uh, but you know, this course is called financial accounting. So we do not do a lot of management accounting uh, you know, techniques. Uh, but the difference essentially is that uh, the use of data in accounting to take decisions. Uh, how do we do that? Uh, in fact, ratio analysis we've already done. That's also you know, kind of management um, uh, accounting. So that's the difference between the two. But there are you know, many more methods of advanced financial analysis. Uh, when you start talking about managerial accounting, you actually start talking about managerial finance because there is no more accounting. Now you're taking decisions, you're analyzing the data. And then you are worried about project finance, working capital management. So there are a lot more other topics which are covered in a course called financial uh, management. And uh, you know, if things work out well, I, I do intend to record a course on financial management in future, maybe next year sometime. Uh, that course will have you know, more uh, techniques of managing finance, thinking about organization level decisions. The second question, uh, any good book, you look at the course handout, I think it's there. Uh, I have recommended two, three books. So look at those books. And actually NCRT, NCRT books are very good uh, way to find practice problems. So NCRT textbooks, textbook accounting. So just put these keywords in Google and you will find class 11th or class 12th uh, accountancy books and you will have plenty of uh, practice problems that you can refer to. Uh, the level may be a bit basic or maybe more complicated because right now we are doing more. <laughs> uh, this is not an in-depth course on financial accounting, although we talk about a lot of uh, you know uh, transactions, a lot of details. But still, the accounting which is taught to people who do chartered accountant or who are training to become accountants, uh, you know, that's slightly different. This is more from the point of view of helping you read the financial statements, helping you uh, analyze the financial statements. So orientation is a little different. But in, in the NCRT textbooks, you should find many practice problems. Uh, you should go there. Question three is, uh, you have informed in the introductory video that the course uh, could be a bit theoretical for the initial few days, how to maintain interest and motivation. I think that's something for you to figure out. <laughs> I've, I've done my bit. I've already recorded and I've tried to use many examples uh, in, the, in the course. And uh, if it is not still interesting, I think I fail as an instructor, a MOOC instructor. <laughs> but I would say read read more, uh, look at the uh, subscribe to a financial express or economic time, read more financial news. 
put in some money in stock markets and then <laughs> when you are worried about uh, you know whether the stock is going up or down you'll start reading more about the company you look into the finances so you know it's more an incentive problem spend money <laughs> on incentivizing yourself by investing in 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 the shares of these companies okay uh okay i was looking at questions in the excel sheet okay let me go further no question and one more question is writing general entries on the basis of claims generally okay i think i answer this question the raghu has put in a question in the excel as well uh okay i think i've answered the cash received and discount given question as well all right done so uh, there's one more question from deepthi what is the exact way of income tax calculation <laughs> all right so this is uh, income income tax is a different subject altogether i i did study income tax and i do file income tax but uh, i don't think i am an expert on teaching income tax it's very different but you know since you have asked a question i am a professor i'll answer something <laughs> so uh, i'll just give you some orientation on how to think about uh, income taxes all right so income tax there are two types of taxes okay they are called uh, these are called indirect taxes and there are direct taxes okay income tax are direct taxes income taxes all income taxes are direct taxes now income tax can be charged to individuals on their income or can be charged to companies on their profit all right now this is what is called income tax here and this is what is called corporate tax it is an income tax but is but it is a tax on the income of the company company's income is called profit so they don't don't call it profit tax they call it corporate tax okay this is one way of thinking about uh, you know an overview of what are taxes indirect taxes are you know sale sales sale tax uh, gst actually no more sale tax gst uh earlier we had vat and other things but gst is the indirect tax and there can be others uh you have plenty of other tax excise duty uh, uh other custom duties custom duties the reason we call them different names is uh, because the in case of direct tax you are directly responsible to deposit tax on your income in case of uh company the company is responsible to deposit tax pay tax to the government you are directly responsible however in case of indirect taxes indirect taxes are let's take one example gst in case of gst this is business this is customer the customer pays the selling price 100 rupees uh, 100 rupees is paid to the company out of the 100 rupees that the customer pays to the company <coughs> the company collects 10 rupees as gst and 90 rupees as the selling price so company's actual income is only 90 remaining 10 is a tax to be deposited uh, to be given to the government now the tax is called gst which is kind of a sales uh, tax the government says whatever is sold or bought by the customer the customer will have to pay tax on that so the customer has to pay tax and customer does not pay tax to the government directly the customer pays tax to the company and then company is responsible to pay tax to the government this is called indirect tax that's that's how the distinction all right but how taxes are uh, you know calculated uh, there is a you know long process uh, i you know uh, for lack of ignorance or whatever i'll just give you a basic framework there are you know different slabs of income different slab the first slab for individuals i'm talking about there is a no tax slab and i don't remember the current tax slabs i think up to what 3 lakhs there is no tax something like that uh, there is no tax slab and then there is first tax slab and then there is a second tax slab right 
so let's say up to 5 lakhs and i'm not saying this is the rule up to 5 lakhs no tax then up to 10 lakhs there is some tax and uh, beyond 10 lakhs this is per annum and per annum this is per annum income now if your income if your income is let's say uh, 3 lakhs your tax is zero if your income is uh, 6 lakhs if your income is 6 lakhs then what is going to happen is uh, so tax rate is 0% here 10% here and 20% here all right i think the maximum tax level is 30% in india so clearly this is not a good representation of current tax system but the tax structure is something i can explain for sure if your income is 6 lakhs then the way tax is going to be charged is uh, on 5 lakhs tax is zero on remaining 1 lakh the tax is going to be 10% so 10000 is your tax that's all if your income is 12 lakhs then what is your tax on first 5 lakhs you pay zero and on the next 5 lakhs you pay 10% so you you are going to pay 50000 and on remaining 2 lakhs you are going to pay 20% so you're going to pay another 40 uh 40000 right yeah so your total tax is 90k in this case and 10k in this in this case this is a huge diversion from accounting this is not accounting at all but i just entertain the, the question for corporates um, i think current rate is what 33% or something there's a flat rate but there can be different taxes uh, as well there are sir charges and what not all right so not getting into that but basic tax structure i think the question was intended towards the income tax but this is how income tax is calculated for individuals not companies let me get back here okay i've answered all the questions which were provided on the uh, form and now i am going to going back to the youtube live and looking at the questions so nptel office says the live session video will be available on the same link okay this is a response to manjula all right or well, there was a one uh, one question i missed navneet says what will what we will do in general entry of settlement account i have not Talked about any settlement account. What is a settlement account? I think the question is not clear at this moment. You can try to re-articulate or provide more uh, explanation, please. Okay, Sumona so Roy has a question. I am a bit late with the assignment and weekly sessions. Okay, I think it's more an emotional question. <laughs> so, effort leads to result, all right? So, and I don't come in at all. <laughs> I'm nobody to comment. You make an effort, you get some result. Or if you have already have background in accounting, then you know it may not affect your result now. But if you're if you're not looking at uh, the sessions and not looking at the assignments, assignments are weekly. uh they go by there is no making up for that so that will of course affect your performance so if if you intend to if you intend to qualify uh, the exam you want a certificate then you should certainly uh, you know think about how you can manage your time organize your time better to uh, uh look at the videos in time and if you think that you're going to look at two weeks videos at one go that's a bad strategy this is a technical subject there's a lot of you know uh, detail that you have to get your hands and mind you have to wrap your head around so i would not recommend delaying it uh, further than one week watch week by week and it's only two you know one and a half to two and a half hours sometimes three hours but mostly it's around two and a half hours we made sure of that so two and a half hours is nothing before going to sleep just look at one video that's all you already look at what netflix and what not <laughs> before you go to sleep so 
just make it part of that schedule and that's all okay i think we are over time as well i'm waiting for another question one or two questions if there are any i'll wait for maybe one or two minutes and then we'll just switch off i hope you are having good learning in the course and uh, do do send you know feedback if you find anything wrong with the videos any anomalies any technical problems anything i've said wrong feel free to send me uh, uh, an email this is my email i'll just type out my email this is my work email feel free to uh, send any comments any suggestions any questions you have feel free to ask the questions to to me on the email as well although i suggest you use the proper channel which nptel office has suggested but no worries if you have any other question happy to facilitate the learning in any way possible great thanks manjula likewise this is the first time i'm offering a mooc through nptel it's an interesting experience i've not recorded a course before as well so yeah i'm learning more as i teach more thanks okay great i guess the session is over and i'm going to go off mahesh anything else do we need to wait around or can we just go off now i think i've answered all the questions this i look forward to uh talking to you guys again next month i think we are doing this monthly so look forward to that bye bye for now